Hello and welcome to 3ABN Now. We're really pleased that you've joined us today and I know that you are going to be blessed by the program. We have a special guest and we're going to learn all about him and the ministry that he and his family are involved in. Blake Penland, welcome to the program today. Thanks. It's good to be here. Well, it's, a, it's a delight to have you with us. Um, I have a special Bible verse to read to you that Blake it's one of his favourite and I know that it's very special to him. We'll ask him why in a moment, but it's also extremely important. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I love that verse, or those two verses. They're beautiful. They're so full mm. of really wonderful things. Why are they special to you? It's like, for me, that's like a summary of uh, what has happened in my life. Um, mm. I've been transformed by the renewing of my mind, and it wasn't really anything that I did, it was something that God has done in me. And, um, you know, I'm not claiming to be perfect or anything by any means, but I'm different because of Jesus mm -hmm. and I've been transformed by the Word of God. But you also do prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God yeah. through allowing God to transform. Yeah, it's allowing God to work in my life and the lives of my family and, and people around me um, he is able to do his will. When I, when I allow less of me and more of him, the more and more I allow him into my life, the more, uh, more perfect will it is. I think of the renewing of the mind, and that is when we as a people go into the Word of God and we find out what it says, we are informed and we can make informed decisions. And those decisions change our behavior. Absolutely. And so that's, that's the text. When, when we allow God to come into our mind and we follow him, our character and our ways change. Yeah. And uh, we know that's happened with you. <laughs> that's so. true. <laughs> so we want to get into your story because you have a very exciting, though at times difficult yeah. story. It's exciting because we see what God did. That's the exciting part. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. what's always exciting about mm. someone's story, the miracle that God brings into someone's life Absolutely. when they yield to him. So start us off. You are not Australian. No, how could you tell? <laughs> <laughs> I just guess. People always do. I'm on the streets and I'm like, oh, that guy's not Australian. And I'm just like, how do they know? <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm not Australian at all. Uh, I, was, I was born and raised in Northern California. Now, when I say that, most people think that that's like, Hollywood, because they hear California, Hollywood, but Northern California is actually quite similar to maybe Texas. Mm -hmm. um, very, it's, even though it's Northern California, it's very Southern feel. Very, um, I had horses growing up, you know, we had like, I think we had like seven or eight dogs, we were hunting, fishing, that was our livelihood growing up, you know, and, and that was, uh, that was the area that I'm from. So not the California that most people think of, but, mm -hmm. um, Northern California. <laughs> it's a beautiful country. Oh, it, it really is, actually. Yeah. It's a place that you want to grow up. It'd be a nice place to bring up to. Mount Shasta and all of that. Yeah, that's a beautiful the place. The snow and the everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I, I was raised in, I think we have a picture, actually. I'm not sure if we do. I was raised in what a family that they call uh, rednecks. Um, <laughs> I thought they were from Tennessee. <laughs> well, they are. Well, actually, the, my whole family actually they are from North Carolina. They moved over uh, to to Northern California right um, right when my dad was born. And so the whole my dad was the youngest of seven brothers, and most of them are there. And, and which one is you? I'm the I'm the very little guy in the green with the green shotgun right there. With the big uh -huh. gun. Yeah, the big. That's a that's a 20 gauge, I think. 20 gauge shotgun. We used to have competitions. Um, for Christmas and Easter um, shooting competitions, and that's and we had a little trophy for in our family, that whoever would win. But most of my family 
uh, was drunk, so my dad and I, uh, we won most of the time because they weren't very good at shooting <laughs> from that. So, so you didn't mess with the penland? No, you don't, you don't mess with the penlands, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you have any church upbringing? Um, yeah, so no one in my family is, is really Christian um, per se, but uh, my, my mother and my father, they became Adventists. Well, that must have been after the photo was taken? No, no, they're, <laughs> they're just, uh, they're still country, country people. But um, uh, my, my, my dad, uh, he became an Adventist and my mom did and, and they got married and then just a few years later, uh, uh, I, I came around, that's what happens. <laughs> and um, we were... I don't know how to say. We we would go to church every Saturday, um, and we. It, it's hard to explain exactly, but maybe I think we were maybe more culturally Adventists than uh, convicted Adventists, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and my parents, they they did a very good job um, raising me up. And do you have any brothers and sisters? I have one little sister. Um, her name's Bryce Santa. I think there's a picture of her later on. But uh, I just always had a very rebellious spirit in me and I, I'm sorry to say that but that that was the truth you know and so my parents they I think they try to do their best with me but I uh, was quite quite wild spirited I was very independent and wanted to do everything on my own um, so when I was five years old or we, we I was raised in this little place called Round Mountain and when we were five years old uh, our house burnt down mm. and we had to move to another place um, and that, that time made me realize how fragile many things are. Like it can just burn up and you have to lose everything at yeah. the moment. Yeah, it's terrible. So when that happened, we moved to a place called Palisadro. And in Palisadro, uh, there, there's, a, there's a, a church there and a church in uh, the, Reading, the Reading area. One, one church is a little more, I don't know what the word would be, uh, Maybe liberal would be the word, and maybe another word, and the other church in the other area was more conservative. Mm. And um, <laughs> my experience was kind of going between the two churches all the time. And uh, at one place, uh, someone told me, uh, basically, if you, if you don't follow the Ten Commandments perfectly, you won't be able to go to heaven, and you'll burn in hell. And I thought, whew, that's not a very good thing. And then, and then at another place, um, someone said to me, uh, it doesn't matter what you do, you can do anything, and uh, God's love is so amazing, you're going to go to heaven. And I thought to myself, I don't know if I even want to be in heaven if you can do anything and then get to heaven, because then there's going to be some people there who are not that, not that good. And then I thought, oh, you know, so I kind of... You were, con you, were, you, were draw you were confused by... I was. Yeah. I was really yeah. confused. And I, it and sounds I, like the people were confused. <laughs> I think so, and I think, I, I think they, they were confused. Not, they weren't trying to be confusing but they I think that both of what they're saying had a lot of truth mm. but a little bit of error can really mess that whole picture up mm. and I think you yes. need a, I think you need both of those uh, centered in Christ to really have a full mm. picture of God's mm. love definitely so, so what about your school years you know wh wh where did you go to school well I went to public school most of my life and what what really got me into the Adventist culture I guess you could say um, I played American football and we, uh, our team was quite good. We actually never lost a game, and we won the championship. And then the coach asked me to play on the varsity team for the next year. But um, my job was, uh, I played middle linebacker. So I was a big guy, and I'd run around and tackle people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the coach thought I was good at it, so he was like, we want you to play for the top team. But all the games were on Friday night, which mm -hmm. was okay. Sabbath. Now, at that time... I didn't really understand it, but I knew that we didn't do anything on Sabbaths. So mm -hmm. I just thought, well, that's just something we don't do. And, and uh, I talked to my dad about it, and he said, well, you can choose what you want to do, but, you know, this is, this, we, don't, we don't do those things on, I, I won't be able to come to any of your games on Friday night if you choose to do mm -hmm. that. He let me have a choice. And I actually chose, I, I said, okay, I don't want to do that. And I decided to go to the Adventist school because someone from our church actually offered to pay for us to, or to help us out to go there. That's mm -hmm. good. So that was my introduction to the Adventist culture um, on any other day besides Sabbath. <laughs> and so we went to the, we went to the, the school, and um, it was, I wish I could say it was a great experience, but it was actually kind of tough because um, not everyone at Adventist school is Adventist. And 
Whereas at the public school, it's easy to say to your friends, oh, I'm, I, I can't go to that party because you know, it's Friday night and Saturday night, you know, and we don't do, or we, it's Friday night, it's Sabbath, I don't do things on Sabbath. And they're like, what's a Sabbath? And you know, well, it's just this day I don't do anything. That's what I thought. Mm. And then when I went to the Adventist school, kids were still asking, hey, are you going to come to the, this party? You know, and because partying has been an issue for kids, I think, even now and has been for a long time. Yeah. You have to make a decision on what you're going to do. And at that place, everyone knew about the Sabbath, but they still would go and choose those. So instead of me saying, well, we don't do that because it's the Sabbath, they're like, yeah, we know it's the Sabbath. And I was like, okay. And so I, I saw a lot of, a lot of compromise, a lot of um, even to the point hypocrisy, to the point where I was like really disenfranchised with the whole Adventist culture. I was like, I kind of came to the point where I was just like, look, just be something or don't be anything, but like, don't be in that middle ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, think, right. I think the Bible actually talks about that as well. <laughs> I think there's, <laughs> that's one of the major problems, not just in the Adventist church, I think in a lot of churches. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of people who are just going along for the ride and they're trying to straddle a fence. Mm. Um, and it's, you can't. Jesus says, choose you. Well, the Bible says in many places there was, there was Elijah, there was Moses, there was Joshua, there was lots of them. Choose you. Yeah who you were going to follow, because you've got to follow one or the other. Mm, it, you can't follow two masters. It's because it's, it's not possible, because it's like choosing between evolution and creation. You can't choose between the two. You have to either pick evolution or pick creation, because they are you can't put them exclusive. Mm. So God and the world are exclusive. Mm. You can't have both. And, mm. and what I saw was a lot of people trying to have both, um, and, and that really pushed and, me away from it. And, and, and to be honest, I didn't I didn't have any personal relationship with Jesus at all. I'd never, I never read my Bible. I went to Bible studies and mm -hmm. everyone else, they would read it. I, I saw a verse, but I never read the Bible on my own. I never prayed to God on my own, except for maybe like, keep me safe while I'm snowboarding or something. You know, it wasn't like... Or if you had to say grace. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or like, please bless this food. But, but it, wasn't, it wasn't a real... Because a relationship should be integral. It should be something that is, uh, you, you communicate with God. God communicates to you through His Word and, and, and through a, time spent. It's a part of everything you do. Yeah, it's, it's not just a 30-second thing you do every now and then. See, Blake, I really believe that if you really want to know about God, and that's to our viewers out there too, the Word of God, God is speaking to us in the Word. If you don't spend time in the Bible, then you will, you really just talking off the top of your head or hearing what other people say. It's like in engineering where I'm involved in, to become an engineer, you really have to go and get books and study on design and all aspects of engineering. But, you know, when it comes to God, we think we can just know about God yeah. because we go to church on Sabbath mm -hmm. and, and that's it. Well, the reality is you need to study your Bible. You need to be versed in what God is actually saying to you. There's power in the Word of God that will change your life take time to open the Bible and read it. And you know, Blake, as a young person, how can you learn about God in just a few hours on one day when you go to church without taking time to actually read the Word of God? You know? I've actually found if you're, if you're not spending time with God throughout the week, even when you go to church, mm. it's hard to even spend time with God at church. That's right. If that makes sense, mm. you know? Exactly. Now, somewhere along the line, you ended up in Australia. Yeah, true. But a couple of things happened first. I went to a place called, so I went, I went through the Adventist school system and I kind of... Did you finish high school? I finished high school. Um, so it was year 10 that I went. So went in, in America, it was a, my sophomore year and then junior mm -hmm. and then senior. So the, the last three years of high school, <coughs> secondary school. Then I, I graduated and during that time, I actually started to... Um, hang out with some of my family and some of my other friends and I started to drink and to smoke a little bit. Not a lot, but just every now and then uh, would, I would start smoking when no one was around or I'd have a little drink or something. And it was quite accessible because um, the my bigger family dynamics and my, mm. and my friends, you know, and so it was quite easily uh, to be done. And, by, and when I was around 15 or 16, I, I kind of even though I was at home, I 
just kind of went and left as I pleased. I was very independent. And by the time I was 17, I moved out. I, I never actually moved back after I was 17 years old. Mm. And so, uh, but eventually I ended up at Pacific Union College, which is an, an Adventist school. I got a scholarship there, which Good. I'm really, I was really happy mm. about. But after my first semester, um, they actually told me that unless I pay $4,500, I have to leave. And I thought, ooh, that's a lot of money. So I. What about your scholarship? Well, the scholarship covered that first semester, <laughs> but then for the next semester, it was. I mean, I had to pay more, and the scholarship didn't cover for the full year. It was just. It was. It's quite expensive at school in America. Yeah. Mm. Um, so it's an incentive to get you there. That's probably. I think that's and, what. And it it's really a good was. incentive because yeah. sometimes people who really want to just can't make that first initial step. Yeah. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm glad it happened actually. And uh, what happened was, because I heard about this, I, I asked my friends and family I, for, for this money. No one could help me out. And so for the first time in my whole life, I fasted and prayed. Because I'd heard about that at one of the little, they have like Vesper programs at the college. And I'd heard, okay, so if you fast for things and you pray about them, you get stuff. Mm -hmm. and I was like, that sounds like a good deal. So I, I went to God and I said, okay, God. I'm not going to eat anything or drink anything for 24 hours, and then I would like you to put a cash or check into my finance, uh, into, into the finance department, $4,500, we'll call it even. And that's, that was my prayer. I was like, well, that's what you have <laughs> we'll to do. We'll call it even, and after that, I don't have to talk to you anymore. <laughs> that's, and, well, because that, so I, really I think I was treating God more like Santa Claus than, mm. than the God of the universe. So personally. you're telling God what you want. That's right. I told God this is, I, well, and I kind of said, if you want me at PUC, this is what you got to do. Mm. So, um, and did he? Well, I fasted for that time, and after, and after about three hours of my fast, I was like, what have I done? This is crazy. I was so hungry. Yeah. And every, uh, but I did it. I, I did the 24-hour fast, and then I went to the finance department, and there was no money there, and I was pretty disappointed. So I went home for the Christmas holidays, and uh, I said, you know what? All through high school, um, I was really good at sneaking out of class. And I said, I bet I could sneak into class and no one would even know. So I went back the next semester and I started sneaking in to all of my classes that I wanted to attend. I wasn't on the roll or anything. And something, and this is for people out there as well, I started to take notes in class. That is really useful for studying. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that at the time, but taking notes actually does help you be a good student. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it does. Yeah. So um, after that, I, I was in the, the cafeteria and the uh, finance department. Well, they had actually been trying to get a hold of me for a while, uh, but my roommates were kind of covering for me. And then um, the finance department, there was a lady there from the finance department. She actually caught me by the shirt in the cafeteria, and she took me to the finance department, and she said, we need to talk. And I, I thought I was in trouble. I thought I was in a lot of trouble because I'd been going almost two weeks to school without being registered. And um, she sat down, she said, you need to sign this paper. And I, she didn't really explain. And I got this piece of paper and I looked at it. And it was basically accepting a payment of $4,500, the exact amount that I had prayed to God for. And I, I signed it immediately. But then I said, who is this from? And they said, an anonymous donator just said that you needed this and they want you to go to school here. And I was uh -huh. like, whoa. It just blew me away. I mean... It was exactly what I had fasted for and prayed for. And so I was, I was just like on top of the world. I was like, God is good. And, and so because I felt good, my relationship with God was good. Because that's, mm. at that time, that's what I thought a relationship with God is all about, about your feelings. I, I've learned a little bit different lately, but at the time, that's what I thought. So I went to Santa Cruz um, for a surf that weekend. I loved surfing. I went to Santa Cruz for a surf that weekend, and I met this girl. Um, who was like a, she was like an associate youth pastor, you know, and um, this girl, uh, she was at the Adventist church, you know, and we started dating. She was my girlfriend, and I was like, this is awesome. I, I, this is actually what I thought. I thought, you know, this is really incredible because I prayed and fasted. God gave me what I wanted. Now I have an Adventist girlfriend, and even though I wasn't really pursuing my relationship with God, I was like, this is like my free ticket to heaven, you know, mm. having a girlfriend. That's what I thought. I, I don't know if that that's, was my mind thinking at the time. And oh, so... I've got a question, though. Yeah. 
Because God got that money for you, did you keep taking notes? I did take notes. <laughs> I did take notes, um, but I didn't. I I kind of. I didn't really spend time with God. You know, I was just like, he gave me that thing. That's cool. God is good. I've got this girlfriend and everything was going great, you know, for about two months. So every week and we would go down and hang out with this girl and we would go surfing and life was good. Um, but then as life does, um, the storms came. You know, my wife talks about storms in, in her life as well. And, and uh, a storm came and I found out that this girl was cheating on me with someone else. And it really, mm. whew, it really cut me hard because I, I was like dealing again with this hypocrisy. And I, I thought, you know, I thought you were supposed to be like this Adventist, you know, so a helper pastor person, you know, and, and I thought, you know, I, I don't want anything to do with the Adventist church. And, and uh, I got, actually, I got so mad, I found out who this guy was that she was cheating on me with. And... Um, I broke into his room. I was actually gonna. I was actually gonna kill him. I was. That's how mad I was. So, um, and I was the guy at the time. Um, if there there was, for, let me back up a little bit. There was a guy who used to go around at the school, and he would break into people's room and try to scare people. And he would wear like a mask. Mm -hmm. Well, one time he broke into our room, and. I, I beat him up, <laughs> and he didn't bother anyone. I said, don't do that in this floor again, or I'll beat you up again next time. And so he, he left, and he never came back. So I was, the kind of a, I was kind of a rough rougher guy, um, and I was going to break into this other guy's room to basically beat him up. I, I was so mad. And I remember this probably changed my life, my, the course of my life. When I broke into his room, he knew what I was there for. And I, was, I walked up to him, and I was just about to punch him, and he just said, hey, man, I'm so sorry. You know, I didn't know that she was a girlfriend. She didn't say anything. I'm, I'm really sorry. Do you want to smoke some weed? And that decision, him saying that, totally changed my direction of life completely because I said, yeah, I do. And I started smoking weed because now I felt this pain in my life. And so I thought to myself, you know, I've got this hole in my heart. I've got to fill it up with something. And so I tried to mask that pain with marijuana. And it worked for a little while. But the problem with, with drugs um, is you have to keep taking more and more and more to, to mm. get that feeling and sensation. Yes. So then I started uh, mixing that with other drugs and, and started drinking alcohol and, and, and going to parties because I had this... Remember I said before, I felt good, so I thought my relationship was good with God. Now I felt bad, so I didn't want anything to do with God. And then I felt guilty because I was going to go to these parties, and it was just like I was spiraling down and down and down uh, farther away from God. Uh, I think, for me, the best analogy is um, my daughter likes to blow bubbles. And the bubbles, they go up into the air. And bubbles are this really big experience, so, so much fun, so exciting. It pops so easily. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what Satan offers in the world. You have this big, it looks fun, but it's empty inside. And it can pop just like that. And the only way to have that experience again is to get another bubble, to go to another bubble. But what I've found is my relationship with God, it's the exact opposite. It starts like a little snowflake. It's very delicate. And it can be messed up quite easily at first. But as you add more experiences, more snowflakes on, you create a snowball that's solid and it's filled. Strong. And it's strong and it can't pop easily. And so you have the world that just pops easily and then you have that snowball effect with God that the more time you spend with Him, the more solid you get in that relationship. Mm. So no mm. matter how you feel, God is there. You know, you know, Blake, I noticed you said you felt guilty. In other words, you knew what oh. you were doing was not right. Yeah. And, and I want to tell the viewers out there, if you know that you're doing that, you need to think about what lies ahead. God cannot bless. If you're feeling guilty, God can't bless and help you until you turn to Him and realize what you're doing. You are experiencing that. We all do. We all know when we've done wrong or we're doing wrong. And so that's an important point that you raise up. If you have that experience, think twice and go turn back to God because He will help you overcome the drug addiction and all those things and the, and the big bubble, as you might say, and bring you back to reality because we're talking about reality. And 
and that knowing that that guilty feeling there was someone who came and and he it was very it was a very weird relationship because this guy one week he told me um, how I needed Jesus right and I didn't want anything to do with it. I told him to get away from me go away you know but then I had actually started um, I'd started selling selling drugs mm -hmm. and then that same guy who came and told me about that uh, that I needed Jesus he actually then bought drugs from me mm -hmm. and then when I realized that I thought there's that hypocrisy again and I in my heart uh, that I remember this was the turning point in my life this is why I went to Australia um, when I put the drugs into this, who, to this guy's hand and I took the money, it was like I sold my soul to the devil. And it was at that point that in my heart I became an atheist. Because if God was real, I knew I was doomed. So I just said, no, he doesn't exist. Mm. And maybe, it's the easiest thing to do, isn't it? Was. It was. And so I remember taking the money back and, and, and realizing, and there was this more of this hypocrisy. This guy who was supposed to be representing Jesus is then buying these things for me and I just thought and, and that's when I became really disenfranchised with people and I just saw everyone was just everyone was fake and I, I, I became very cynical very antagonistic towards other Christians and I hated God and, and, and I couldn't even say I hated God because I just pretended he didn't exist mm -hmm. and that's when um, uh, someone someone came from Australia who's actually uh, his name was Calvin Chuang. I don't know if you know Calvin Chuang, but he was he went to Avondale College and he came over to PUC and he was a uh, he's Chinese, um, but he has a complete Australian accent. Now for me, I didn't know that. Ex I know now there's people from many cultures that live uh, that live in Australia, but at the time I thought everyone looked like Crocodile Dundee. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so I saw I saw this guy who's Chinese um, and he spoke like Crocodile Dundee and he was like Bruce Lee and Crocodile Dundee combined and I was like I will do whatever you tell me to do you're the coolest guy ever and he was just like you should go to Avondale and I, so I agreed and I went I, I just packed my bags the very next term over that summer and I came to Australia and from the very beginning I never had any intention of changing any of my ways and I was able to find people um, to go and party and to go and drink and to go clubbing uh, and 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 the thing is I want people to know that too is like even in our own churches people are struggling with issues and mm. you can you yeah. can make a choice you can make a choice to say oh look there's problems in the church and so I don't want to be a part of it or you can say look there's problems in the church I want to go and help you mm. have you have a choice exactly. to make and so at the, in, at, the, at the college, there was people that I found doing this, and I was doing it myself, and, and um, I, 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 had, I went to a party, and I had drank. It was, I was here for about a month, and I drank so much that I blacked out. I didn't, even, I didn't even know how I had gotten to the place when I woke up in the morning. I'd never had, had mm. drank so much, and I'd, I'd really gone to a, a dark place. Because I had to fill that pain, and that's what I thought was was the way to problem. fill it. But it really, it doesn't solve any problems mm. I, I, like at all. So you know, Blake, just just thinking about what you've been saying, you've said now you've grown up through your life, you've had an association with God, you've experienced praying to God and Him answering you in an awesome way. What you're really saying is there's a difference between knowing about God and actually knowing Him. Absolutely. And the knowing about God is you're describing a person's life who knows about God. But I didn't know him. But you didn't know him. Not at all. Because once you know someone, just like you were courting a young lady, once you get to know them, you want to be with them. Do you want to hurt someone you, you really have gotten to know? No. no. Child doesn't want to be hurt, hurt their parents the same. And that's the kind of God we serve. Once we get to know him, all those things, and I'd encourage, you know, I want to talk to those young men and young women out there, that if you just know about God, that's not going to help you through the crises like you go through, yeah. like you've gone through. But once you get to know him, he then is able to guide you. That's why someone said, when you need Jesus, you really do. Yeah. Mm. I, I can so, agree more. So talk us through how you got to know God. Okay, so like I said, I, I had been drinking and I blacked out. And I woke up in my room and this was 
another pivotal time in my life that I'll never forget. As I, I opened up my eyes, and I didn't really know how I got there, and I heard a voice as clear as day. I don't, I don't know if it was audible or not, but it was a very, it was a small, still voice in my head that was just very clear. And this voice said, I didn't bring you halfway across the world to do this with your life. And I thought to myself, wow, what, what am I doing with my life? And then I thought, who just said that? You know, because mm. at the time I was like, I don't believe in God, you know. Mm. And I didn't, want that per I didn't want that to be real. And then it was just moments after that, I heard this, this knock on the door. And I opened the door, and there was this, this person there, and we'll just call him Guy. And so Guy opened the door, and, uh, I, and he said, hey, uh, he was Australian, and he said, hey, you should come listen to Herb Larson uh, speak. And I said, who's that? And he's like, it's a, it's a Christian evangelist from Canada. And I just thought, oh, man, well, I, I won't say exactly what I said, but I said something not very nice, and I sent him, I said, go away in more words than that. And he, he was pretty like, whoa, that was kind of a mean thing. And he left. But he was persistent. And he came back the next day and he said, you've got to come listen to this guy named Herb Larson. And I told him where to go. Where to go. Yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't a very nice person. So um, I'm sorry about that guy. <laughs> but um, he came back a third day. And for some reason, God had put on his heart that he needed to come and get me to go to that place. And even though I had sent him away very harshly two times before, sometimes it doesn't matter what people say to you. And if God puts it on your heart to go and share him with someone, go. go. Mm, don't exactly. hesitate. Don't worry about what they say. If God, if you know that God is leading you to do it, I mean, if God is for you, who can be against you? Mm. Mm. So, Because the Holy time, Spirit knows yeah. when the person is in a position to listen. Absolutely. It, Even if they say no to start with, keep on it, because people, the Holy Spirit is there telling you. People are like almost kind of like revolving doors. You know, sometimes the door is open and the Holy Spirit has a chance to meet that person and sometimes the door is closed. And I really feel like the Holy Spirit knew this was a pivotal time in my life. Mm. So the third time he came and I actually said, okay, look, I'll go, just leave me alone. <laughs> and uh, we went, I listened to Herb Larson. Very, I was very skeptical. And he was an evangelist, and he said two things that changed my whole outlook on God. And he said, because of my belief in God, he said, just from a psychological perspective, even if God's not real, he says, I do believe God is real, but even if he isn't, just psychologically, I have an advantage over people who don't believe in God. And I thought, mm. oh, yeah, what, what are you talking about? You know? mm. And he said, because of my belief in God, I have a psychological advantage because... I was created for a purpose and not evolved. And secondly, I have hope for the future that no matter how bad life gets today, mm. Jesus is coming soon. And I thought at that time, my only purpose was to party and to get high. And my only hope was to do that every day. And it was so empty and it was so, it, was, it wasn't good. It was worthless. It was, it was that bubble popping experience. And I thought, Maybe this guy's on to something. So, and, but he, and then so he kept talking, and he, all through the week, it was, uh, it was like a week of prayer. So he would speak in the morning and the evening, and I think I started going on a Wednesday morning or something. And I went back the night, and the next day, and the next night, and the next day, and the next night, and it just blew my mind. I was like, this is incredible. So he, he challenged all the people. He challenged all the people that were listening, and he said, um, I challenge you to read your Bible for an hour a day. Spend one hour with Jesus every day for three months. And if your life isn't changed, I will pay you for the time that you've wasted. And I was like, Phew. that's a good deal. I know. I thought to myself, I, I'm a bit of a businessman. I thought that's a good deal. You know, it's an hour a day. And I calculated out, I can make a little, a little money here. So I actually... Um, I sat down, I, I was still sitting there in the front row um, because I started in the back and then every day I kept moving up a little bit more because I was so interested in his stories. And then finally the very last day, um, they had actually let me play a song, which they didn't know anything about me. And I actually played a song for a special item. Um, I play guitar 
and it was actually a song about my doubts about God. So that no one checked or anything about what the song was. And then after the song, they were all like, uh. Uh, what, what just happened here? <laughs> and I sat down next to this little boy from Africa. And he was sitting there, and we were in the front row. And uh, I just looked up to God when Herb Larson basically said, I, I want to put God to the test and see what he does. So I looked up to God, and I said, God, if you're real, put a Bible into my hands. If you do, I promise I'll read it. I'll spend an hour of a day with you. But if you don't, I'm out of here. I know you're not real then, and I'm gone. So if you're real, this is my one chance, because I was, something was happening inside. Something mm -hmm. was stirring. Mm -hmm. And then right after I said that prayer, this little kid from Africa, uh, he looked, I think he was seven or eight at the time, looked at me, and he said, hey, I, you know, kinda, we just started a conversation. He wanted to come hang out with me, and I think he wanted to play play uh, drums while I play guitar or something sometime. And I was just like, okay. And I think my exact words were like, sweet little black dude, sounds good. And then he was mm -hmm. like, well, you need to come meet my mom. And I was like, okay. And um, so I, I went with him, uh, and then I saw this, it was like the most beautiful. Stunning. It was. It was, it was <laughs> it, she was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. And she was actually glowing because the lights from the church from the back were like behind her and she was just like, it was like, ah. And I, <laughs> my very first thought when I saw this girl, as I said to myself, I'm going to marry this girl. And then my second thought was like, whoa, you don't want to get married. That's commitment. That's a relationship. I didn't want anything to do with that in my life. And then my third thought was, no, no, you want to marry this girl. You're going to marry this girl. And, and it, and this girl was the boy's mom. Yeah, this girl was the boy's mom. It was, it was weird to, to think that. And actually, we had this conversation. She shared with me some crazy stories about what God had done in her life. And I was like, whoa, that's crazy, you know. And I went back to my room, and I told my roommate, I said, hey, you know that girl from Africa with the kid? And she was, uh, my roommate was like, yeah. And I was like, I'm going to marry her. He's like, oh, yeah, right, yeah, right. And he was like, well, whatever, you know. I want to have a f see the photo of what you looked like. When I came to Australia? When you met her. That's, that's you me. with a kangaroo. Yeah. Feeding a kangaroo right there. And that's you with long hair. Yeah, that's true. I had a big beard, but I had just shaved it off just before that picture. Mm. That was a fun time feeding that kangaroo. Yeah. I was, I was surfing. I was very... I, ha I had a different look. <laughs> <laughs> very different look. <laughs> and... Um, so the very next day, someone invited me to go to a Hillsong concert down in Sydney. And, and if there was anything that I hated more than Christians at that time, it was Christian music. I hated Christian music uh, because I was really into music. And I thought, I, I had this thought, like, um, especially with like Christian rock music, I thought it was just fake. It was just like, what's the point? And I didn't like it at all. And so I said, no, I don't want to go to this at all. But the guy, he said, I'll take you surfing if you come. And I just said, okay, that sounds good. And so I, I agreed to go as long as he took me surfing afterwards. And we went down, and then there was a, a, a black American guy preaching. And I remember distinctly, I, I, I absolutely disliked the music. I was like there, I was like, ah, oh, this is so, I wasn't into it at all. And, um, but there was this black American preacher, and he said, I'll try and do it the way he said it. He said, if you want to give your heart to Jesus, come down and I'll pray with you. And I thought, wow, I think I do want to give my heart to Jesus. And I stood up. I stood up and I was like, no, I can't give my heart to Jesus. I, I'm, I'm addicted. So many addictions. I'm addicted to uh, drugs, to alcohol. I, at that time, I was you know, struggling with pornography in my life, struggling with with smoking cigarettes, struggling, so many things. I was addicted to all yeah. these things. I thought, God can never love me. God can never accept me. I'm broken. and I'm a hopeless case. So I actually just walked out because I said I was hopeless. And you know what I think that is? That's Satan. Mm. Whenever you get close to come to Jesus, Satan's right there to say, <laughs> you're not good enough. Mm. Yeah. And um, as I walked out, as I walked out this, um, this, a uh, little tiny, uh, I think she was like 12 years old, little girl. She grabbed me by the shirt, and um, she just said, hey, wait, before you go, 
I have a gift for you from God. And I was like, what? Walked over to this chair and I picked up a book and uh, the book said level 27. And as I looked at the book, I, I even asked the girl, what's level 27? And she said, it's the 27 books of the New Testament. And I realized in my hand that I had a Bible in my hands. It was mm -hmm. incredible. And so what, no, the thought was, oh no, or was it fantastic? No, it was, it was, I was blown away. I realized, because I secretly, no one else knew this, but even though I had prayed that prayer, God knew my heart, I wasn't going to pick a Bible up. Because I knew if I picked a Bible up, you committed. No, I committed. That's yeah. right. <laughs> but God like tricked me into putting this book that he didn't look someone, like a Bible. He got someone to give it to Yeah, you. he uh, the, yeah. put it right there in my hands and I was just like, ah, and I realized, and I remember I actually almost hit the girl in the face with it because I was like, do you realize what this means? And she was like, it's a Bible. And I was like, I have to read this and God is real. And she's like, amen, brother. It's like, <laughs> you don't understand. And, and she was like, at that point, I was getting really intense, and she was like, you are a little bit scary for me. <laughs> and, just, and then I just left. I just got on the train. I didn't go surfing or anything. I, I started reading the Bible. It was from Matthew to Revelation, and I just read it like a book. Every single day, I started getting up and started reading my Bible, and I was blown away by this Jesus guy. I remember the first, I, I, I read probably 10 or 12 chapters of Matthew. First time I'd ever read the Bible, and I was like, this, my, fir my first thought was, this Jesus dude rocks. <laughs> He's like the coolest guy in the whole world. And I made a decision as I was going through that um, anything that Jesus lived, anything that he believed, and anything that he taught, I would do those things in my, my own life. And as I went through, and I told myself, no matter what happens, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm going to be perfect. And for about a week, I tried to be perfect. And then I realized that I was actually the biggest hypocrite of anyone. Mm. And that I really needed to let God work in my life and work on my heart. Um, From that point, you started reading the Bible. You started learning about who Jesus is instead of just what you had heard. And at the same time, you started seeing Mal Venus. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got a photo of Mal Venus and his son, Marlon. Yeah. That's um, and so that's the girl that you said you were going to marry. Absolutely. And so you started seeing Jesus in Malvinas. Absolutely. And Marlon, too. Yeah. Um, Marlon's a great young guy. He, uh, I, I don't know what it was, but Marlon and I, we just hit it off and we, we hung out together and we were just playing all the time and, and, um, and Malvinas, too. And, and after about a week, uh, she invited me to go to church with her and, um, we started dating, and uh, I, I think you, you've heard her story. She had actually, yes. I didn't know I was prayed yes. for. I didn't know I had a very long nose, but <laughs> apparently that's what I do have. And um, she, uh, she, she, we didn't know, she didn't tell me anything about that. I just thought I must be pretty cool because she said yes to dating me. So I thought, oh, mm. this is awesome. Mm. Um, but I remember we had been dating for about two months, and we went to... Uh, Big camp, I think. They, they call it big camp. It's a big Australia. gathering. Of, yeah, it's like a camp meeting. Yeah. Mm. Well, we went to that, and I was really annoyed at her because I, well, I had gone with a friend, and she was up there too, but I was really annoyed that she wouldn't get annoyed at me because I realized how much of a hypocrite I was, but she wasn't. She actually said what she did and did what she said, and I got really mad at her. And I, I remember distinctly uh, just saying to her, you know, you actually say what you do and do what you say like it's so annoying and you don't get annoyed and I was like how do you do this and then she just said something this is another pivotal point in my life she just said anything good you see in me is Jesus in my heart mm -hmm. and anything bad is just me and I realized that I had a whole lot of me and not enough Jesus in my heart and so I said how do I get Jesus in my heart and so we actually got on our knees even though I've been reading my Bible even though I've been raised Christian in an Adventist environment, I didn't have that hmm. Jesus in my heart. Hmm. And, and then I remember that was the pivotal point. It just changed. And you gave your heart to Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus. You asked him to, to forgive yeah. you. and Forgive me of my sins. And, and, and didn't you, what happened with your drugs and your alcohol and things? <laughs> I don't know what happened to them. They just disappeared. <laughs> like God just said, you are unable to do this. I'm going to do this for you. 
And so he took all these things and he just went, whoosh, ripped them out of my life. And the more I read the Word of God, the more I was transformed. You didn't like need them that. Anymore. Yeah, I, I didn't need those things because, and I, I wish I could say, like, it was just just gone and I was a perfect person. I never said another swear word or I, I never thought another impure thought, but it didn't work like that exactly. But God took the things out of my life that I could not work on. And then I think he allowed some things so that I would continue to depend on him. Mm. And that day by day, as I read the word of God and I have that prayer life and, and what is so important that people it's so simple, but people don't realize it. It's a devotional life. Hmm. If you don't spend time with Jesus, it's really difficult to ex just expect Him to be there for you when you need Him. Hmm. But, and He will. He is there for you. I don't want to say it like that, but when you have that devotional life, it just is all the difference in the world. You're always conscious yeah. of the fact that He's there. It's praying without ceasing, walking like Enoch walked with God. Hmm. And, and I believe that as God created the universe and created the world with his word, I believe that he recreated my heart mm -hmm. um, with the word of God that I was reading. And so mm -hmm. since I think it was September 2007, I haven't smoked, uh, I haven't taken any drugs, I haven't uh, drank any alcohol, I haven't done any of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like looking back on your life now, you've experienced a lot of things. You've, the viewers have heard <sighs> you tell some quite remarkable stories. But let me ask you this, do you feel now that you're equipped or you're better able to help people because there's a lot of people out there that are going through what you've gone through? You know, I'm sure you would want to say something to them. And uh, I, I just feel that's important right at this moment that you just think about this. Yeah. You have an opportunity to talk to those people you are associated with in the time. Are they still doing the same? And, what, and if they are, what would you tell them today? God is able to take broken, shattered sinners and make them into complete Christians if you are willing to allow Him to come into your life. Hmm. And I have some friends, uh, you know who you are if you're watching this, um, nothing in this world is worth missing out on eternity with Jesus. And I would just invite you right now, if you haven't done so, give up all the things that are holding you back. Don't let the chains of your addictions, the chains of your sins to hold you back because God can forgive anything. All you have to do is surrender to Him, believe that He is the creator of the universe and the, the savior of this world and the savior of all humanity. If you do that and ask for forgiveness of your sins, um, God is faithful and just and He will forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and He has a place waiting for you in heaven with your name on it. Mm. And all you have to do is accept that free gift. So mm. I really want to encourage you, if you haven't taken the time uh, to, to what, my, what my dad used to say, what, to get right with God, mm. take this time to get right with God and to allow Him into your heart. And get that, a Bible. And get a Bible. And read it. Absolutely. Read it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's step two. I think step one is to, to, to make that commitment, and step two is to, to continue the commitment. To you know? develop it and make it yeah. grow. Yeah. Now, we've got um, some other photos that we need to show and things we need yeah. to talk about, and we're running out of time. Ooh. This was your graduation from social work. Yes. So. And who's the man? That is the man, uh, my father. Uh, he has recently he's passed away, which mm. was a very, very difficult time in our lives. But um, he's always been there for me, and I have nothing but respect for that man. And he, I remember every morning, uh, almost 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, he would wake up and he would read his Bible like clockwork. Mm. And if, nothing, if, if he taught me nothing, he taught me the value of reading the Word, even though at the time I didn't appreciate it. Mm. But now looking back and remembering that, um, that is a pivotal, a pivotal point in my life, remembering him every morning so faithful and getting up. You know, that's an important time. point. Morning is the best time. Any other part of the day you're occupied with, with other things. things, that's right. 
but we need to um, remember that that's our time when we're there's quiet and we can actually communicate with God. I'd yeah. like I'd like to go to a couple of other photos right now. One of them is the, your family. Well, these ones here. This is to do with the ministry you have with Malvinas. Yeah. Um, mi miracles without borders. Yes, this is where it started. This is in uh, Atawifi Hospital in Malaita, Solomon Islands. Because I gave my heart to Jesus, I said the next step was a practical step. Well, now I need to go tell other people about Jesus. Yes. Mm. And mm. so I had an opportunity to go to Solomon Islands, and this is on the island of Malaita, and I was there. All of these people there were teaching me their language. And so I was in my little book right there, writing it down, trying to learn their language to communicate. Because a couple people knew a couple words in English, mm. and I put them all together because I was trying to learn the language mm. so that I could speak to them. Then we went to another place, and um, because I learned, this is in Guadalcanal in Solomon Islands, and that's a baptismal class. Uh, those are 15 people who decided to get baptized. Um, and now have been baptized. Um, I think it was just two years ago they got baptized now. But this uh, happened because we came in on a helicopter and um, there was a lady there named Nancy. No one knew who she was, um, but she knew English, the only one who knew English. And she taught me what I needed to know to speak to those people in their language. I think it's called Koyo, the Koyo language. And... Uh, I was able to communicate enough for those people to hear the message of Jesus, and it just blew me away. Yeah. But you told me an interesting fact about that lady um, in a previous discussion. She disappeared. Nobody knew who she was. Yeah, that blew my mind. She disappeared. Um, I asked around for her in their language because I had written it all down, and uh, we didn't see her again until uh, we didn't see her again until uh, we were walking out that morning, and. Uh, she just waved at us. And when I asked other people about who, where is this lady, no one knew who she was. And, mm. and the group that I was with, we actually believed that uh, she was a messenger from God. Mm. And wh whoever she was, she came and taught me just enough so that those people could get to know yeah. the message of Jesus. That's it was a, a miracle. That's a real, really and that's really what thing. started Miracles Without Borders. When that story happened, I said, people need to know about God working around the world, Miracles Without Borders. Mm. Um, I just want to go on to the other photos we have. Yep. We have a picture of your family yep. in the U.S. There's your dad, your mum, and your sister. Yep. Malvinas, Marlon, yourself, and Mizpa. Mizpa's hiding in Malvinas' stomach right there. Yes. <laughs> yes, I asked her how she got into her mother's stomach. Did her mother eat her? And she said no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we've got Malvinas' family. Yeah, this is on the other side. This in is all, all our brothers and sisters. Those are all her sisters and, and brothers-in-law and her brother and sister-in-law as well. Now, there's something, um, something else that you did uh, when it came to... Yeah, this is what I wanted to talk about just briefly. Yeah. Um, actually, what we'll do, we'll go to the address roll, and then I want to come back and talk just about that. Um, I will share Jesus. Okay. So let's go to the address roll for uh, Miracles Without Borders so you can write down how to contact Blake. If you would like to contact Blake through his ministry, Miracles Without Borders, you may email him at contact at miracleswithoutborders.org. That email address again, contact at miracleswithoutborders, all one word, dot org. Find out more about his ministry by pointing your web browser to www.miracleswithoutborders.org You may also follow them on Twitter with the handle at MWO Borders. Contact him today. He'd love to hear from you. We've just come back after the address roll. And we hope you wrote that down. And we want to introduce to you Malvinas. And Mizpah. Yep. Hello, Mizpah. And Mizpah. Marlon. Now, I, I must say, I love Marlon's smile. Yeah. It's, it's just <laughs> really you. neat. <laughs> um, so this is your family. This is the crew. Mm -hmm. And um, you have I Will Share Jesus. Just briefly tell us about that. Um, I Will Share Jesus happened when we came back from the islands. Um, we just saw some videos online. And because we started this 
uh, Miracles Without Borders <laughs> on Facebook. Face. We just put a, a little post if anyone was interested in going just to hit the streets Can of Sydney to share uh, Jesus, show up in a red shirt. And we went down to Sydney and we just started singing songs and telling people about Jesus on the streets. And about 200 people came with us. And wow. it wouldn't have happened uh, without Miracles Without Borders doing that. And miracles wouldn't have happened. <laughs> miracles Without Borders wouldn't have happened without God. And but so, you've done that some other times now. Yeah, we've done it in Perth. Newcastle, mm -hmm. uh, whew, Adelaide, a whole bunch of places. Maybe people can get in touch with you at Miracles Without Borders if they want to get involved in something like that. Absolutely. It'd be and be totally part awesome. of I Will Share Jesus. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We would love that. I've got one more photo which I want to show because this is from 2013. You are graduating what from? Uh, I graduated with a degree in teaching. So I have a degree in social work and teaching. And uh, this is right after... Uh, I spent two more years. I went back to Avondale, started taking more notes. <laughs> and um, He became a good student I, this time. I, and yeah. so that I got my degree in teaching, and then we went, just yeah. recently moved over to Perth, mm -hmm. and we, uh, I was a teacher for year one and two, full-time teacher, while Malvinas was doing nursing, and the kids were uh, just growing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I have. We've seen Marlon especially grow quite tall. Um, now, Malvinas. Yes. You met this man. Yep. It was, uh, he was a little bit... Different? Di little oh, bit that's rough. the right word. Different, different, different right word. Rough. <laughs> but he was the answer to your prayers. Absolutely. What has life been like seeing Blake being transformed by God? Uh, I don't want to make his head swell up. It, it's still, it's, it's, he's, he's changed a lot from where he was and, and God is doing a mighty work in him. And, um, I've, got a lot, so I've got a lot of room got to a lot still room grow. To change, but um, he, he has come a long way and, and God has been good. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. Praise God. Yeah. Excellent. Now, with Miracles Without Borders, just, I just want you very briefly to just explain what you do there with the website. Um, it's a place to read stories uh, about what God has done around the world, to share your story of what Jesus has done in your life, and to increase our faith uh, to know that the Holy Spirit is working in people's lives today all around the world. Mm. I think it's a really exciting ministry because mm -hmm. um, sometimes people just need to know, is there a real God mm. and can he do things in our lives? Mm -hmm. And if people are posting miracles up there on that uh, website, then others can come and read them mm. Absolutely. and be encouraged. Mm -hmm. You know, God performs miracles. Today, the viewers are seeing a miracle. Yes. And that's a, that's a two-hander yes. because coming back from where you were. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that you've been blessed. I'm sure you have. God bless you.